friend isn't my friend. You hear Troy, the drummer? It's still good. Listen, Jordan, you too. Come on, let's go. Go on, go Pastor. Down. We're going to pray that God's going to use the word of the Lord today. We need the revelation to come down now so we can understand the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your grace. We pray, God, that you will give liberty in the spirit for your Holy Spirit to move up and down the aisles today to give us your word to the understanding, the interpretation, God, so that we can apply it to our lives. Father, we thank you for how great you are. We thank you that there is nothing impossible for you we thank you god that you can reverse anything you can change anything god you can transform us lord i pray that you will show us if there are any blind spots that we have even in our own lives god whereby we need to make a change so father we pray that you will speak to us make your word clear so that we can say amen not only by what we say but also by how we live in jesus name we pray amen we're going to look at the Word of God together, and we are continuing our series, which is the power of one verse to transform your life. That's what we're looking at together, and we're going to trust that God will give us the Word that He wants us to have for today. And this is our verse for today. We're taking one verse, and we're dissecting that verse in our understanding of it so that we can better apply it to our lives, so that it will bring about a transformation, which means that we're going to live differently as a result of whatever the word is for today. And here it is. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 23. Let's read it together. And do not give the devil a foothold. Period. How many say amen? That's God's word for today. And do not give the devil a foothold. There's something that takes place in American football more than any other sport. And it's what's called game film. The opposing team takes the time to watch videos of the team in which they're going to be competing against. They watch the team constantly, especially the quarterback, over and over and over again in order to decipher, to determine what their tactics are. Because people, when it comes to the victory that then they win on the field, if something works once, they tend to do it several times or they have a certain game play. So the opposing team, which is known as the enemy, is going to be looking to see what is your game play. And the reason why they do this for every single team is because every single team is different. The same thing is true with us. This, this person that's called the devil, he has several names, Satan, Lucifer, we can go on and on, but you know who I'm talking about, right? And he has a game play on you. That means that just like the football team has a game play on the opposing team, he has a booklet on you. He wants to know how you work. How do you make decisions? What causes you to lose your mind? What gets on your last nerve? Who gets on your last nerve? Who is it that he can bring into your life to dishevel the place where he, God wants you to be? Now, there's something that's sure about the devil, and he cannot take away your salvation. Because your salvation is secure in Jesus Christ. The second thing that he can't do is he cannot make you sin because you have to voluntarily give in to something in order to sin, but he can set things up to encourage you to do so. The other thing that he can't do is he can't take away your health, for example, because he needs the Lord's permission in order to do that. So he is limited in what he can do, but one of the things that he does do quite well is he loves when you give him a foothold. Because he can't do a whole lot without a foothold. A foothold simply means, by definition, that the opportunity in order to advance. You've probably seen a climbing wall. In some of the parks in Bermuda, they have small climbing walls in order for you to get up to where the slide is. For my two-year-old, that's a challenge. 
three now. It's a challenge for him because he's like, Daddy, help me. Daddy, help me. I'm like, just you got to put your foot. So I'm teaching him, this is where you have to put your foot. If you put your foot in the right spot, you can advance in order to get up and there's nothing that can stop you and you don't even need my help. As long as you put your foot in the right place. We were at Long Bay Park, which now has a playground there, and just showing him how to do that, how to use your foot in order to have a foothold because all you need is a foothold in order to advance. All the devil needs in your life is a foothold, and a foothold is described as a strong first position from which further progress can be made. He just needs that first step. And what happens is that this is something that you have to make available to him in order for him to get an advancement. In other words, without a foothold, he can't do anything. He can't climb up. He can't advance. So you have to give this to him in order for him to wreak havoc in your life. And he's fine with waiting until the opportune time because that's how he works. In the context of this one, what we want to do is we want to look at the different footholds that the enemy uses. What we want to do is we want to reveal, we want to pull back his schemes. His schemes are his devices. A scheme is a deceptive strategy. So instead of the devil looking at our game book, we want to look at his game book today so that we can be more sensitive to the fact that there are certain footholds that we may have in our lives that go undetected. And here it is that God's saying that I want you to know how the enemy works. So footholds. The context to the verse that we looked at today is this. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now this tells us something about anger. Anger is an emotion from God. Not all anger is sinful. There is a righteous anger that you may have that is necessary in order for you to protect, let's say, your family. There may be a righteous anger. There may be a righteous anger that you may have in regards to sin, which we should have. The Word of God says to hate sin. Love the Lord, but hate sin. And so, therefore, anger is not necessarily sinful. However, anger can certainly be sinful. When anger becomes rage and when anger leads to malice and when anger leads to a lack of self-control. So that's why he says, in your anger do not sin, but do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. In other words, he's telling us to deal with the situation rather than allow the anger to consume you. Because when the anger consumes you, resentment sets in. Unforgiveness sets in. Malice sets in. Malice is when you are happy when the person who irritated you gets hurt. You rejoice. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. You are looking very spiritual out there. <laughs> but I know when stuff goes down, all bets are off, right? People get vexed. People get irritated. People say things that they shouldn't say. People get slammed the phone down on other people. All that type of stuff goes on when you're angry. You ever have a situation when you're angry and you're about to get angry and then something happens and takes you off of your anger? Don't you hate when that happens? <laughs> I remember on a few occasions, at least three or four occasions, when I'm irritated about some form of customer service in our beautiful country. And so I go there, and I'm ready to complain. In fact, I remember this one time I was coming up to the counter. I had my argument ready. And, of course, you've got to be mad sometimes in order to get what you need done. You know what I'm talking about? So you've got to go there, and your righteous anger is just about to fall off the cliff to unrighteous anger. You know what I'm talking about? You're going up to the counter, and you're ready to just let them have it. And you're like, excuse me. This was, I was like, excuse me. And I was just getting ready. And you know what? The person had the nerve to tell me. Hi, Pastor Gary, so good to see you. Good afternoon, how are you today? (laughs) 
You know what that's like, right? I'm sure you've had the opportunity too. Because you knew you were ready to let some people have it. But because of the grace of God giving you a second chance, you say, okay, well, let me calm down a little bit. So what we need to realize about anger is anger is serious. If you allow anger to go unchecked in your life, it's going to lead to a firestorm in which the enemy is going to have his way and get a foothold. So this is foothold number one. Keep this in mind is anger. Anger is the road on which the devil travels to hinder your life. As long as you stay angry, the more the enemy has to work with you. The more he has to work with you. Now we said that the enemy can't take away your salvation. He can't make you sin. He can't do certain things in your life. But one thing that he looks forward to doing is to prevent you from fulfilling the will of God. The angrier you are, the less you will fulfill what God wants you to do because the word of God says man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. He says that in the book of James. So we have what's called the law of first mention. Everyone say the law of first mention. This is a theological term when it comes to hermeneutics or the interpretation of the Word of God. That if you're going to do some Bible study about a certain thing in the Word of God, it's good to go to where that place first showed up. Or where that person first showed up. Or where that thing theme first showed up. It's called the law of first mention. Because when you first see something introduced, it gives you usually greater insight into what it is. In this case... Because the devil is our game book today, we need to look and see, well, where was he first introduced? Well, we know based on the word of God that he was already cast down to the earth. Because the Bible tells us that there was darkness on the surface of the deep. And the darkness there is symbolic of evil. So remember the word of God also tells us later on that he was cast down from heaven onto the earth. So the earth was formless and void, it says in the beginning of Genesis chapter 1. And then the Lord just decides to say, let there be light. And we know the light is the glory of God because the sun wasn't created until day 4. So the light in day 1, and there was light, let there be light, and there was light, had nothing to do with the sun. That means the glory of God turned his light on the earth, which meant that God has a plan. Adam and Eve haven't even been created as yet, but God has a plan. He creates Adam and Eve. He gives Adam some work to do, which means that work, listen to this, work is not a curse. Let me say it again. Work is not a curse because work was given before the fall. Some people think, oh, Adam and Eve, now I'm going to go to work on Monday morning. It has nothing to do with Adam and Eve, Okay. <laughs> Work is a blessing from God that he gives us. Maybe we work too much, but it's a blessing from God that he gives us. Some don't work at all, but it's a blessing from God that he gives us. And so even in heaven, we know that there are different things that we're going to be doing. You're not going to be on a cloud with a harp, looking like those fat angels. It's not, no, it's not about, that's just stuff that is fictitious things that have been added to destroy theology. The word of God says that you shall reign with Christ. The Word of God even gave indication you will be responsible for one city. You're going to be responsible for more. There are people going to have different responsibilities of leadership depending on how they live their life on earth. There are various different roles that the Lord would have us to do even in heaven. Or in heaven meaning even on the new earth because keep in mind in the book of Revelation it says that heaven came down to earth because God so desperately wants to be with us. But it says here, now the serpent, if we go back to where the law first mentioned when the devil first comes about, it says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Now this is before the fall, and it talks about the serpent. The Bible says that the serpent was beautiful, but somehow the way in which the serpent would walk, because the serpent had legs at this time, the snake, the way in which it just walked, it was just so smooth. And however it walked, that it got the word crafty or something that just, like, it was smooth. You know what I mean? It had a smooth walk. I remember when I was a teenager, I was in North Philadelphia, North Philly. My friend 
Brian Austin, he lived in North Philly, and sometimes on the weekend, his mom will cook, and it's great when you're in college and you can go over someone's house and get a nice home-cooked meal. It was like a southern meal, too, collard greens and all. I remember that. And so Austin was one of my great friends in, 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 in college. We were in Bible school together, and um, I had to do this project. It was a uh, um, cultural anthropology class, and I had to assess the social dynamics of an area, and you had different things that you can choose from, and I decided to do the ER, the emergency room of a hospital. So the university already had permission in order for us to go, so that's the one I signed up for, and the one that I signed up for was in North Philly. It was Temple University Hospital, one of their, their ERs, and that's where I decided to go. However, at the time, which I didn't realize, North Philadelphia, the, 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 the crime was off the charts. I mean, it's amazing at night how North Philly completely transforms at this particular time. Maybe they cleaned it up some, but I'm telling you, it was insane. And so what happens is when his mother realized where Brian was taking me that night, she says, Gary, where are you going? I said, I'm going uh, to North Philly. You go to North Philly, you got to get rid of that Bermuda walk. You got to know how to. <laughs> you got to walk like you're from Philly. She says, so come on, copy me. And she's teaching me how to walk, you know, how to walk. She said, because you're going to get robbed in 10 minutes if you use that Bermuda walk. <laughs> the serpent had a George Jefferson type of walk. And so, therefore, the serpent was known to be crafty based on how he would move. That's why the devil used something that was good, which was God's creation, which was the serpent, which was a good thing at the time, in order to bring about something bad. Because that's how the devil moves. The serpent is what he decides to possess because he wants to disguise so the devil always hides the good inside, the bad, inside a covering of good. That's how he works. How do we give the devil a foothold in our lives? By our anger and also by the fact that we don't recognize the enemy. We think that that thing is good because it looks good, because it looks beautiful, but in reality, looks can be deceiving. And when you're not sensitive to the things of God, the devil will come along and bring you something beautiful in order to bring you down. So you got to be alert to the footholds of the devil. When you entertain him, when he knocks on the door, and you know who it is, because you got ring, you know, your phone's going off, you see, that's the devil, and you still want to say, who is it? And you want to open the door and have the chain on and say, well, how can I help you, and have a conversation and entertain him, you give him a foothold. With anything in your life, any form of compromise, that's how the enemy works. He knows, remember, he has the book on you. He knows the type of person to bring into your life so you will compromise everything you know to be true in regards to the Word of God. He knows. He knows your type. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God, everyone say Lord God, the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Did God really say that? Let me get this right, the devil says. Did God really say that you cannot eat from any tree in the garden? Did God say that? No, he never said you can't eat from any tree. He just said don't eat from one tree. But notice the title in the passage. Notice that he starts off by saying this. The writer is Moses, of course. We know Moses wrote the five books. And notice the contrast between the two. Lord God... Now the serpent, Moses is speaking and giving the, giving the commentary. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals Yahweh, Elohim, had made. Lord means Yahweh. Whenever you see capital L-O-R-D in your English Bible, it's the translation for Yahweh. 
which means Jehovah or the self-existing God, the God who exists by himself. But not only that, it's the covenant name that God has given himself, which means that he wants to have a relationship with his people. It was Yahweh, which means the God who intimately wants to be involved in your life and he controls everything and he exists by himself and there's a covenant relationship that was brought about in the book of Exodus. So therefore, as Moses is the one who he was talking to in the book of Exodus to say, when he sees the burning bush and says, well, who is it? He says, I am, which means Yahweh, which means the self-existing God. I don't need anybody to exist because every God in the world, including today, Zeus and everybody else, whether it's Greek mythology, which is real gods that they, real false gods that they worship back then, or if it's the Hindu gods in which there are thousands upon ten thousands of them, or whatever type of God there is, they all have a mother and a father, and they all have a form or something that has to keep them alive or existing. That's why you have in Greek mythology the wars and the wars with all of the gods and so on, things that they worship back then, even Roman gods. So the point is simply this. God says, I have no origin. I have always existed for all eternity. I don't need a river to keep me alive. I am the Lord God Almighty, and I am God over all and everything. And Jesus Christ has the title, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So this means the one who wants to have a relationship with you, the Yahweh Elohim. Elohim means powerful, the God who is powerful. So he is the God who wants to have a relationship with you, self-existing God who is powerful, than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. But Satan doesn't use, he drops one of the names. Which name does he drop? Lord. Why? Because Lord means the personal God that's involved in your life. So he just uses a terminology which is intentional. He says, did Elohim really say, the powerful God, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You see, there are many people in this world that know God as Elohim, but they don't know him as Yahweh. They know him as Elohim, and they say when they say their grace, oh, dear God, help us, dear God, deliver us, and they're spiritual in regards to how they sound, but their hearts can be far from the Lord. And this is what we call nominal Christianity. There are those who just want to fall under the radar of saying, I identify, yes, I believe in a God, I believe in the big guy up there, but for him to have a, I don't have no relationship with him, I just believe in him, I respect him. You know, those are the people that go around and say, much respect, respect, yeah, respect job, respect. You believe in an Elohim, but you don't have a personal relationship with him. You got me? He drops the name and says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So notice the contrast there between Lord God and God. Why? Because this is the tactic of the foothold that the Lord wants, that, that the enemy wants to bring about, and that is religion. The devil always places religion over relationship, especially when he wants to get to you. He don't want you to think about God as being the God who loves you and has a relationship with you. He wants you to look at the church. He wants you to look at worship. He wants you to look at prayer. He wants you to look at the things of the Word of God as religious. It's just something that we do just to keep the devil off our back or to keep God off our back. But to have a relationship with this one? No, no, no. It's religion. You realize how dangerous religion is? You know what took Jesus Christ to the cross? Not the crazy people that were dancing in the session hall. The people who took Jesus Christ to the cross were the religious ones, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's how dangerous religion is. We wrote a devotional called Religion versus Relationship in order to expose the ways in which the enemy uses religion in the lives of people even within the church. A religious spirit can enter a church. It's people who think that they're even more spiritual than other people. I call them super spiritual people. You know, they live up here, but don't do nothing for Jesus down here. And so, therefore, religion is a danger, but the enemy loves religion. Don't the Word of God says, even the demons believe in Elohim and shudder. Even demons believe there is a God. 
It's a doctrine of demons, actually. So therefore, religion is how the devil can get a foothold in your life. When you start to remove the relationship and you start doing things out of a ritual, oh, I just got to do it. I just got to do it. And it becomes such a mundane, difficult thing to do. And you know what happens when you're religious? This is an indication that you are becoming a religious person rather than being led by the Spirit. Is the commands of God become hard to obey. You know why? Because the Word of God tells us, and John the Apostle says, and his commands are not burdensome. Jesus Christ even said, come to me, those of you who are stressed out and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if it gets really heavy, that's a lack of the grace of God because we are moving from relationship and moving into religion. Beware of the way how the enemy has. That's what's in his book, religion. He uses religion as a foothold in our lives. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You see, the devil always has to take a little bit of truth and mix it with lie or legalism in order to cause the hook to take place. Because he can't make Eve do something. He needs Eve to voluntarily give up in order for him to have his way. It's sort of like what we said about pickpocketing. He probably tried that first and then that couldn't happen. Let me see if I could get her to give it up. So what he does is he says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So what he loves to do is simply this. He loves to create doubt. The devil always reduces the Lord's command to a question. Always. This is how the devil gets a foothold in our lives. He wants you to reduce what God has said and put a question mark next to it. You know, God says, so I want whatever comes out of your mouth to be to the edification of the church, which means whatever you say, it should edify somebody else. Question is, did God really mean that? Or when something, somebody offends me, I have the right to go to somebody and complain and talk about them. You see? The question mark. God says, I want you to be pure before marriage. Do we put a question mark there? And then shuck up and do whatever we want. God wants you to marry those who are in the Lord. Do we want to put a question mark there and go after whoever? God says, well, I have a plan for your life, so trust in me. Do we put a question mark there that because things aren't going the way that we want them to go, so we take matters into our own hands and manipulate and try to make things happen? You see how the devil works? Is doubt. Now, it's important for us to understand the biblical term of doubt. Doubt literally means to lay down another road next to a road. It means to lay down another road next to a road. In other words, doubt is always going to have some truth associated with it. This is the truth. This is what God has said. You know, the aisle right here. This is what the Lord has said. This is the command from the Lord. Doubt now is he needs you to keep that truth right there, take part of it. And lay down another road that says, do you really? Did he really mean that? Do you really have to do that? It's just to provide another road next to truth. Doubt would be ineffective if if the devil just came to Eve and says, girl, God just wants to mess up your life. Can't do it that way. She would see that coming a mile away. He has to come with a question. Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And notice the question's even off because that's not really what God said. But because it's associated with not eating something, that's the hook in it all. That's the doubt that he wants to bring about. So keep in mind that when the enemy wants to work in your life, in order to create a foothold, he brings doubt in your life. So you must not eat from any tree in the garden Now, notice how it works. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, 
no Lord. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You see how the enemy worked in her? God never said nothing about touching nothing. No, it no, makes no sense to touch something you couldn't eat. But when you begin to think that God's withholding something from you, you become legalistic in the matter. You must not eat fruit from one tree that's in the middle of the garden. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the only one we can't eat from. But these hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of other trees we can eat from, yes, we can. But that one, we can't even touch it. Actually, we, ac actually, we can't even touch it. I want to touch it, but we can't even touch it. Miscalculation is the foothold of the enemy. The devil will have you focus on the one no to cause you to doubt the goodness of God. And God has no's. There are things that he doesn't want us to do. Isn't that true? In fact, that's the only way you can have freedom. If you have to have some no's in order to enjoy whatever it is that you have, you realize that? In everything in life, there has to be a no in order for you to enjoy it. I started to learn how to play tennis properly. <laughs> That's fun. Having fun. I need to get some type of exercise in. So I'm learning how to play tennis properly. And there are some no's in tennis. There's stuff you just can't do. You just can't pass the serving line and go in the middle and serve. You can't have a ball that goes outside of the line and say it's in. But when you have the rules in association with the game, that's what makes the game fun. The same thing is true of life. There are no's that God has, not for the sake of having no, it's so that you can be truly free and enjoy the life that God has for you. Because if he doesn't say no, you would destroy yourself. It's the same thing with parents with children. There are certain things that we have that we say we don't want you to do. Why? Because we don't want you to grow up and to destroy your life. So you have to listen to my command when I tell you not to do something. Don't look over that wall. Why you can't look over the wall? Because that's a big drop that's about three stories. So I don't even want you to lean up and look over. And if you do, I'm going to deal with you. Why? Because I love you and I want you to live. That's why. Children have to learn how to do that. And it's a good thing when they start to listen to the lessons in which you give them, isn't it? We taught our son, a two-year-old, now three, um, about, actually Bell did in regards to, oh my, oh my gosh. Like one of the kids may be hearing stuff at school and they say, oh my gosh. And it sounds close to, oh my God, and we don't want them to take the names Lord in vain. So Bell shared with them, don't say, oh my gosh. You may want to say something like, oh, my goodness, but don't say, oh, my gosh. And the two-year-old just, just bent into his heart and his mind. and every So we realized that we say, oh, my gosh, as parents, myself. And I'll say myself and my mother. My mother more than me. But, you know, that's how it is. <laughs> no, not God, but gosh. Oh, my gosh. And the two-year-old would say, ma, is not, oh, my gosh, it's, oh, my goodness. Okay, she said, well, I didn't say, oh, my, oh my God. I said, I, th I think he, I did hear you say it. <laughs> then, it. Then it happened to me the other day. Daddy is not, oh, my, this, <laughs> and it's two, so his little. So it's like, Daddy is not, oh, my gosh, it's, oh, my goodness. I said, okay, okay, we call him D.D. Okay, D.D., all right, all right. It's not, oh, my gosh, it's, oh, my, I said, I got you. But it's not, oh, my gosh, it's, oh, my goodness, I got you. So as he's walking away, it's not in my gosh, it's in my goodness. <laughs> so it's a good thing when they start to get it, right? God has parameters in our lives in which he wants us to get it. You know why? It's going to lead to freedom. So God will give you a no. But this is how the enemy works with miscalculation. It's a foothold so that you miscalculate things and you focus on the no as if it's restrictive, as if God just wants to pull you down, as if God doesn't love you anymore, that he's just withholding something from you. So therefore, you better go and take that matter into your own hands because this is your last chance or this is your last opportunity. 
So go ahead and compromise and just do it. The devil would have you focus on the one no and miss the one million yeses that he's already given you. So what takes place? It says, you, now that she's doubting, and now that he has her where he wants her and has her thinking in a certain direction, he's got the foothold. He has it. And then he can now refute and come directly against what God has said and say, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. Let me tell you what God is really like. The one who you serve and your husband serves and you're walking in the cool of the day and you think is old that You know, just like I always would say, if it's too good to be true, it's not true. So let me tell you, for God knows, Elohim knows, that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like Elohim. You will be like him, knowing the difference between good and evil, which you don't know right now, right? I don't. Why? Evil has not been introduced. They only know good. And God didn't want them to know about evil. He only wanted them to know good. So he says, listen, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will get some type of revelation, and you will be like God. Don't you want to be like him? You can be like him, you know. I'm not saying that you need to be above him. I'm just saying you need to be his equal. So he doesn't want you to be his equal By you knowing what he knows, so therefore I suggest that you don't worry about that command and get what you need to get. Notice what he says here. Eat eyes knowing good and evil. You see, John tells us in the book of 1 John that there's only three things that are in the world system that run the world system, that generate the world system, that keeps the world system going so people continue to be sinful. And he says it's the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He says there's nothing else in the world system but those three areas. Say it with me. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. One more time. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are desires. There are certain desires that the enemy wants you to have, and that's what he uses as a foothold so that the natural would kick in instead of the supernatural, that you'll go back to being natural in which the desires of the flesh. Flesh means instant gratification. And the Word of God always, in various cases, uses food in order for us to understand what instant gratification is about in the spirit. God many times has set up the natural world with illustrations so that we can understand the spiritual world. So when you're hungry, some people say when you're hungry, the worms start biting. When you're hungry and you want something to eat, it's the worst time to go to the grocery store. Am I right? When you're hungry. Because you buy stuff that you don't need. You buy stuff that you shouldn't even eat. The worst thing to do is go to a cupboard and snack when you're hungry. Trust me, I know. It's because you end up eating stuff that you know you shouldn't eat, right? So therefore, why? Because the flesh, which the Bible gives our appetite as the example of the flesh. Because when you want something and you're hungry and you eat it, and after you eat it, you don't want to see it again. Isn't that true? You don't want to see the food. Why? Because you're full now. You just you, the, worst, the best time maybe to go to the grocery store, considering the prices, is when you're full. You got it? So therefore, you don't buy unnecessary stuff, you just get what you need. So eat your meal, then do some grocery shopping. Because what happens is that if the flesh kicks in, then you want instant gratification. So as instant as you're hungry and you seem like you're famished, and you can eat, and within 5, 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how fast you eat, you're then full to the point where you don't want the food anymore. You know, it could even make you sick looking at it, right? Sin's the same way. Instant gratification, take it, now do it, don't think it, be full, and then, okay, I don't want it anymore, until the next time. So this is why it uses the word food as an idea for the flesh. The eyes means something that is good looking, but again, it has a price tag associated with it. They say that sin takes us further than we want to go, keeps us longer than we want to stay, and it costs more than we can afford. The eyes can get you in trouble, what you see, and you want it. 
And then it says what you desire, something that you want to have or possess, something that you think that if you get that, then I'll be all that. So he, usually these three things come in a package together. Sometimes they're separate, but usually they come together in some form of a package, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. For God knows, this is the devil now encouraging her flesh to kick in. God knows that when you eat from it, you get instant gratification. Your eyes will be open, doesn't it look good as well? And you will be like him, knowing good and evil. So what happens? The woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, something to eat. It was pleasing to the eye, which will lead her eyes to be open by grabbing that. And also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. And it was a done deal. And we should understand the power of this act because we're still dealing with it today. You realize that? The reality that we all are aging is a result of the fall. You know, Adam and Eve weren't supposed to be aging to the point where, you know, they get old. Getting old is a sign of uh, the, f the, the fallen nature because the Bible, that's why God has to give us a new body. Because the old body is declining. It may not feel like it when you're 20 and 30 and 40. But as time goes on, you notice some changes. Isn't that true? You're acting like I'm by myself. I know what I'm. <laughs> Isn't it true? So what you got to do? Work at it. Keep healthy. Keep walking. Eat right. Bodily exercise profits somewhat. A little, the Bible says. Amen. So we got to take care of the temple. How many say amen? amen. Okay, good. That's more than 10 people. <laughs> so you're going to get a new body. Because of the fact that this is a fallen world, the impact of sin. So this brings us to the last foothold is to tempt. The enemy wants to allure. The devil wants to set you up to operate in the lust of your flesh and the lust of your eyes and the pride of life. And whenever that opportunity arises, he will take the foothold. He will take the foothold. The foothold is to get the initial first strong standing in order to make a further advancement because that's how he works. You know, there was someone, as the musicians please come, there was someone that when you was a chess champion, well-known chess champion, and he went to Europe on vacation, and he also loved to go to the art gallery. So he goes to the art gallery and he noticed this picture. It was a picture of a chess board, a chess game that was in play. The pieces were there on the board. And in this picture, it was different from other portraits and pictures. It had the devil on one side. And the devil was laying back and his head was up. And he was hilariously, he was laughing. And on the other side, there was this young man that was sweating from his forehead, biting his fingernails, and had tears coming out of his eyes. And the title to this piece was called Checkmate. The chess champion stared at this piece for hours and was looking at it there in the art gallery. And then all of a sudden, he said, Am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? And he called over the proprietor to the gallery and says, Do you have a chessboard in this place anywhere? He says, There may be one in the storage room. Let me go check. And he goes and he finds a chessboard and he has a small table he brings out and he lays it exactly how he sees it in the picture, in the portrait. And he says, Look at this. The devil thinks that he's won, but if you look at it, he has one more move. Do you check it? It's right here. This is the one move. And the guy in, at the art gallery said, well, look at that. I would never even noticed that. For the years that I lived here, I never noticed that. The good news is that it may look like the devil is winning. It may look like there's no other recourse except 
to go with the foothold that's already been created. But there is a God in heaven that's able to give you that one last move for his glory. Come on, let's put our hands together. There's another move. You don't have to always give in to the enemy. You can see him coming, can't you? So don't give him the foothold. So all throughout history, what we see is move and counter move. Move and counter move. The devil moves, God gives a counter move. Move and counter move. You see, God created the, the angels. And then the counter move that the enemy comes is, I want to be like the Lord. And what does he do? He goes and tries to be like God and he causes the angels to fall along with himself, the devil. And they're cast down to the earth. The counter move of God was then to come and say, well, let me create man in my image. So I can have people who voluntarily worship me, even though the enemy seems like he is the one who has triumphed. I want them to voluntarily worship me. That's the deal. The coat to move to that was Adam and Eve in the garden and the enemy coming and possessing the serpent so that the Eve will fall. The coat to move to that was the Lord comes and says, okay, I'm going to bring about redemption. The offspring of the woman will crush the head of Satan. That's the goal in which I'm going at. The counter move to that was the fact that Cain then goes and kills Abel, the one who was serving God. Then there was a counter move to that. After that murder, it was the fact that Seth came along. And then as a result of his godliness, people started to call on the name of the Lord. The counter move to that was that the enemy came and tempted the people so the world was so wicked. The counter move to that was the Lord comes and sends a flood and said, I'm going to start off with one family by the name of Noah. Then the counter move to that was to get into the minds of people that they need to be their own God. So they start building a temple to the Lord, Nimrod and the fellows, and they decided to come and build the Tower of Babel. Counter move to that was God introduced languages to force the people to separate and go throughout the earth so there wouldn't just be one center where everyone would be learning the same crazy stuff. There was a counter move to that, and that was the fact that people then started to worship the moon and other things. So there was a counter move God has to that, and he calls a guy by the name of Abraham and says, come out from where you are in your father's household and the worship, false worship you're doing, and come to a place. I'm going to bring you to a promised land. Counter move to that was the fact that Tara didn't serve the Lord and try to hold up the whole process. Counter move to that, Tara dies. God then allows the people to move into Canaan. Then there's a counter move to that in which the enemy comes and causes the people not to serve God and to get away from the Lord, especially through jealousy with these 11 brothers and one by the name of Joseph. And they decided to sell him into slavery. Then there was another counter move, and that was... God comes and allows him to interpret dreams and to interpret the dream of Pharaoh. Then there's a counter move to that. What happens? He then says, well, therefore, because of that good thing, go down there to Egypt. That's right. And I'm going to put you all into slavery. Then there was a counter move to that. God calls a redeemer by the name of Moses that's going to stand up to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And it goes on, move after counter move to move and counter move and move to counter move to the point in which we get to the point where God says, okay, it's time for me to come down. Jesus Christ comes, born of the Virgin Mary and comes in order to bring about redemption. And then the counter move to that is the devil generates and energizes a crowd to shout out, crucify him, crucify him. And causes Jesus Christ to die on a cross. And the counter moves of all counter moves of all counter moves was the resurrection of Jesus Christ in which he says, now I'm going to give my people and have a relationship with them and put the Holy Spirit in them. So now that you can live wholeheartedly for Jesus Christ, therefore the victory has already been won. The relationship is now intact. Therefore, the last move is now not up to the devil. It's not even up to the Lord because he's given us everything that we need for life and godliness. The last move is in your hands 
And that is, am I going to give the devil a foothold or not? That's the move that you need to decide on from now until you see Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The next chess move is in your hands. However, be reminded that the devil is already defeated and you've already won the game. So the greatest form of spiritual insanity is to have the victory and then allow yourself to be defeated. Because Jesus has already given you all that you need to live for him. So what move will you make? Don't. Do not. Under no circumstances, give the devil a foothold in your life. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you, Lord, and we want to thank you, God, for your word. And thank you, God, that you took care of this whole game. And it wasn't even a competition from your eyes. This was just you working and you networking. And you even used what the enemy wanted to do for your glory throughout the word of God. This is not a contest of equals. This is the Lord God Almighty who is far greater than the devil and has always, always been. This is a situation which the devil is even accountable to you, Lord. So how silly would we be, God? Myself included. How silly would we be to continue to allow the devil to have any foothold in our lives in which we allow him and give him the opportunity to have a footing? Father, I pray for all of us in this room, in this building today, and ask that you would not allow us to give the devil a foothold in any form or fashion in regards to our relationships, in regards to even our entertainment, what we watch for movies or entertainment, what we see on the internet. Don't allow us to give the enemy a foothold, God, when it comes to compromising what your word says as a married person or a single person. Father, I pray that you would help us to sacrifice and to follow you because whenever we sacrifice something for you, you give us more than we ever sacrifice or give up. So, Father, take us to a new level of dependency upon you by not allowing the devil to have a foothold in any way in our lives. You say, by the grace of God, I heard the word of God today. And Holy Spirit, help me to be sensitive not to give the enemy a foothold in any way. If that's the desire of your heart, just stand wherever you are. in any way. Father, we thank you for those who are standing. And I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters in Christ that I'm standing with them, that we will not allow the enemy to have any foothold whatsoever. Because it makes no sense for us to go back where the Lord has brought us from. It makes no sense at all to go back. As the worship team please comes. So, Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to follow you. Help us to depend on you. Help us to lean on you, God. And help us to make this song, I Won't Go Back, our prayer before you today. So God, hold us to it. Before we sing that all through the building, I want you to call on the Lord. Right now, let's call on God and say, God, tell him that you're here and you want to follow him. That you will trust him. That you will give up the stronghold. Whatever it is. That you will give it up in Jesus name. Because the foothold. Can become the stronghold. So you're going to give up the stronghold. Whatever it may be. And then clear your wall. So that there's no foothold. It's just smooth. The wall of your life. Let's all pray. Just right where you are.
right where you are, you say, Dear God, help me to follow you. Give me the strength that I need not to give the devil a foothold. Help me to follow you, Lord, with all of my heart. Protect me from doubt. Keep me from religion. Keep me from miscalculations. Help me to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Use my life to do your will in these last days. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we put our hands together in advance for what God's going to do? Before we leave and before we walk out, let's just make this our prayer today. online giving. We thank God for those of you who have given thus far to our church and uh, we're going to pray today that whatever you give online that God would use that to the building up of the church. And so let us pray. Dear God, in the name of Jesus Christ today, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, oh God, for everything that you have supplied for us. And so God, in the name of Jesus Christ, even as we give today, I ask in the name of Jesus that it will be used to the building up of your kingdom in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that even as we give, oh God, that you will continue to supply for us our every need, that whatever we ask for in the name of Jesus Christ, it will be done. And so today, once again, we give you thanks because as you supply for us, oh God, we're able to give unto your kingdom. I pray, oh God, that you'll bless every hand that gives today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you once again because you are God. Amen and amen. Thank you for being part of an awesome service. I hope you've enjoyed our time with us this week. We look forward to what God is going to do with us next week. Stay tuned to Grace Point. Look out for the notices. We're so awed by and thankful for your presence, and we look forward to what He's going to continue to do in and through your lives. Thank you so much for being a part of Grace Point.